And so without further ado, we'll get right into it. So sort of the Vertex elevator pitch is that it's a lightweight platform for microservices with uh, what they call polyglot language support and sort of an actor-like concurrency. So it's essentially node-style concurrency. Um, you know, yo dog, I hope you like callbacks because I've got a callback in your callback kind of style. Um, and so the, the lightweight part of this has actually been really refreshing, uh, both in my work and it's been mentioned by other people as well. It's, uh, it's a platform that mostly stays out of your way. Um, and we'll see this in some of the code I'll present later. Um, it is geared towards microservices. This isn't necessarily the platform on which you're going to host your big database or something like that. Instead, you'll probably have a module or some unit of functionality living in Vertex talking externally to your, your heavier resources. Um, as far as polyglot language support goes, so uh, this is the list of languages that uh, Vertex supports as of their 2.1 release, which just came out, I believe it was within the last month or so. Um, and they are, these are, like I said, I think this is the official list, and there's a couple of others um, whose names I don't recall that are, that are not included in the official list but can be added. You simply change a configuration file to pull in an additional language module and tell Vertex this kind of um, file is associated with this language. Very easy to do. Um, so, so those like JRuby and JPython? Um, yes, okay. yes, Jython and JRuby. And um, I, you'll have to check out the Vertex website for the, uh, what JavaScript runtime they're using. I don't know off the top of my head. So, all right, so jumping right in. Um, let's kind of set up some of the vocabulary and, and give an idea of the different pieces of, of the Vertex system. So a Vertex instance is, um, you know, when I run a, a Vertex module or a Vertex vertical from the command line, it's bringing up a Vertex instance. So that's one JVM, and then it spins up, for each core, it spins up an event loop. And when you launch verticals or launch modules that contain verticals, those verticals get assigned to event loops. Um, and so that's um, each, actually I've got a slide on verticals coming up next. We'll just go right to that one. So a vertical um, with this lovely misspelling um, is the sort of fundamental unit of execution within Vertex. So when I'm writing um, some basic piece of functionality, that's going to be a vertical. Um, it's, you can write it as if it were single-threaded, um, but uh, you, you are running in an event loop, so don't do something synchronous, don't block the event loop. You, you block it for everybody. Um, that's, so any other verticals that are running on that event loop are blocked as well. Um, if you really want to do some blocking, maybe some IO operations or something like that, and this is a, a tactic, a lot of the, um, like for example, the JDBC module that we use um, is actually uh, specified, you can specify something to be a worker vertical, so it has its own worker thread pool, um, so it can do synchronous operations on a thread pool and not block the main event loop. Um, and so the sort of, uh, one of the sort of big ideas behind Vertex, or the, maybe it should have gone on the elevator pitch slide, is that you can run multiple instances of the same vertical, um, and that's sort of how you achieve scaling. I'll talk about a little bit more about that when we get into the message bus, um, or the event bus, rather, and um, see what Vertex brings in that regard. But anyway, uh, the, the point is you, you write your verticals with an idea that you may be running 10 or 20 of them um, on a Vertex instance at one time, or even across a Vertex cluster. So, oh, and I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but please feel free to, to interrupt with questions or or whatever, I'm happy to, to answer whatever I can. All right, so verticals, like I said, were the sort of basic um, unit of functionality. Um, the, the deployable um, unit of, of vertex functionality is, is a, called a module. Um, and so that encompasses the individual verticals. So you might have one or more verticals in a module. You might have none. Um, any dependencies, so any jars or anything like that get packaged up in here as well. This is, um, it's just a zip file, and uh, the other important uh, 
part of this is that the, they're deployed to Maven or Bintray, which I actually wasn't familiar before I started using Vertex, but that's a, a repository for binaries. Um, and so using these modules, you can actually, so you could run Vertex uh, and then point it at uh, whatever Maven repository you want, and then when you say Vertex run this module, you don't have it locally, it will go out and resolve those, um, the coordinates that are in the, um, the Vertex module specification, resolve those to Maven coordinates and download that module. Um, so the, what I'll show later, I've installed modules to my local Maven repository uh, so that when I do, uh, when I run them through Vertex, it's, that's where it's grabbing them from. Um, and there's actually an entire sort of ecosystem around this. There's a Vertex module uh, registry and it's searchable and you can find um, you know, modules for pretty much uh, anything, maybe not anything, but um, lots of common functionality is, is out there. Um, and then the other thing, so modules are, are um, the way that, let me back up, sorry. Um, you're using modules to start up and configure your application too. So if you have a simple application that might be one module, it might be a handful of verticals, you're telling um, that module is, you know, contains a configuration and also uses one of the verticals to um, coordinate the deployment of the other verticals. Um, and I don't actually have an example of that, but it's uh, a common uh, sort of idiomatic vertex thing to do is to have a very small um, app.js file, which is the sort of coordination vertical, and that lives at the root level of your module and launches all of your other verticals and assigns them bits and pieces of a larger configuration. Um, so let's see. All right, something else we get, and this is on, this is a on a per module basis. You can actually cluster vertex. So I, Failed to mention that before this slide, but uh, you can start several Vertex instances either on a single machine or across a network. It uses multicast, they discover each other. Um, and you can, essentially what that ends up doing is sharing the Vertex event bus, which I'll talk about again in a, in a second, um, across all of those Vertex instances that are forming that cluster. Um, you can also, you can do high availability. Um, so what that means in the context of Vertex is that um, you can specify that a module should be highly available. And what that means is if you bring that module up on one Vertex instance and it, uh, it terminates uncleanly for some reason, um, you'll, you'll see me do this with kill-9, um, that module will be brought up on another Vertex instance in the cluster automatically. Um, the important thing to note there is that the Vertex allows you to run modules from a local directory, but if, if that other Vertex instance out there on the network somewhere it doesn't know where to find your module, it won't get brought up. It doesn't transfer it across um, magically or anything. So like I mentioned before, everything that I'm doing is going to my local Maven repository to, to find these modules. So it doesn't do state transfer? No. Um, it, it doesn't do straight state transfer. You can take advantage of some of Vertex's shared, uh, like shared data. Um, functions to, if you want to persist state so that you can bring up um, you know a module that's being sort of revived um, can grab whatever shared state but you have to do that explicitly um, that's going to be part of your part of vertical um, and then you can also um, and so I'm actually going to be demoing the high availability and clustering portion um, later the HA groups is just a way to specify you can say this uh, this module belongs to this high availability group, so it won't get brought up except for in an instance that also has the modules that make up that high availability group. So if you have modules that rely on each other, um, I'll talk a little bit in a little bit just about the constraints around shared data. Um, one of the, the biggest ones is that um, that only works um, across an instance right now, at least in, for closure. So. Um, so that actually, that sort of, that slightly negates what I told you, but I, um, they're planning to support that cluster-wide, so. All right. All right, the event bus. I've mentioned it a few times. Um, this is just a, a, a shared uh, communications fabric. So it's the messages that you, you pass across the event bus are transient. There's no, dur they're, they're not durable at all. Um, 
they you can use some a, a set of basic primitives and uh, but primarily complex data structures are encoded in JSON. Um, that's sort of the, the lingua franca um, across all of the uh, vertex language modules. Um, so to to receive messages, you, you register a message handler on an address. An address on the event bus is just a string. So you can do whatever kind of namespacing or uh, enforce whatever convention you want to, but it, it's just a string. Um, to send a message, you just event bus send the address and the message. Um, in the case of closure, it will automatically um, Convert closure, da closure data structures to JSON and, and vice versa when receiving messages. Um, although there's actually a, a bug in the, the deserialization that's going to be fixed in the next release. Um, there's a couple of different um, topologies available. So there's, uh, there's a point to point. So that's essentially um, sending a message on the event bus to an address. And if there are, if there's one handler registered on the, on the address, that handler will receive the message. Um, if there are multiple handlers registered on that, that address, only one of them will receive the message. Um, and according to the, the documentation, that, that occurs in kind of a round robin style. Um, I don't know if it's, um, if we would want to consider that to be uh, load balancing, but that's just, that's the semantics of that uh, messaging uh, topology. And then the other one, which we're all familiar with, is uh, just PubSub. So you publish a message to an address, and all registered handlers uh, of that address will receive the message. Um, and then there's the, uh, another uh, common pattern um, is this request response. So uh, I send to an address, um, a receiver receives that message, then using that message as the context can reply to that message, and you can keep building that, um, that conversation as, as deep as you want to go. Go ahead. Is this messaging built on like a common library like 0MQ or something, or is it all um, proprietarily built? I believe it's built on Hazelcast. So, um, and actually part of Toby's talk, he mentioned that that um, is modular enough where you could potentially switch that out with some other, um, some other messaging solution or, or messaging fabric that you wanted to. I haven't explored that at all. <laughs> um, all right. And so this is the shared data that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's, it's very simple at this point, and uh, although their plans are to uh, make this work across a cluster, across a network, um, at, uh, right now it's only, uh, data is only shared amongst the verticals and the modules running on a single vertex instance. Um, and so you, you just have maps and sets um, available to you and there are, there's, there's pretty much nothing else. Um, and I actually, I will not be demoing um, the, the shared data at all. But. All right, and then this is gonna recap a little bit and just sort of give an idea of the other things that are available in the, in the Vertex Core API. Um, so we talked about the event bus and shared data. Um, they've got a whole suite of network servers and clients, and they're wrapping a lot of Netty. Um, as in Toby's talk, he sort of called out uh, one of the advantages of Vertex is it hides some of the complexity of Netty, um, and one of its disadvantages is also that it hides some of the complexity of Netty. Um, but and so the, the demo I'll show later is actually going to uh, we'll see uh, HTTP and some SockJS. Um, so there's also, there's a few other things, uh, timers, so you can tell Vertex I want to, oh, you have a question? Sorry. Um, so you can tell Vertex I want to run uh, something either on a delay or periodically. Um, there are sort of lower level buffers in case you want to do um, some you know, streaming operations, things like that. Um, there, there's both synchronous and asynchronous uh, access to the local file system. And, and then there's some other, there's some uh, other API around configuration. But uh, let's, all right, here's why we're, why we're here, right? Uh, so closure support, it was made official in the Vertex 2.1 release that was, that just came out about a month ago. The actual closure language module, um, the oldest git commit in that uh, repository is about a year old. Um, like I had mentioned already, uh, Toby Crawley 
who works at, um, I believe he works at Red Hat, is the sort of primary author, um, and then there's a few other contributors. Um, there's some tooling and libraries that are, that are already available in uh, varying states of, of usefulness, completeness, and reliability. Um, I'll be using, well, actually, I don't know that I'll demo line vertex, but that's what I've been using while I've been developing the, um, the sample application for tonight. Um, that's just a, a Linogen plugin that uh, allows you to easily pull together all of your dependencies that are specified in your project CLJ. It'll build modules for you. It'll actually let you run Vertex. It, it composes a, a sort of a wrapper vertical to launch everything. Um, so it, it's nice, um, although it's not as, th those are the, the two sort of things that it does right now. Um, and there's a lot more, a lot more there. Um, so hopefully we'll see that improve. And then there's actually also a ring, the uh, ring vertex adapter, which lets you essentially wrap the vertex HTTP server um, in ring. And then you can go from there and use Composure and do all of your sort of normal mil middleware and whatever you'd like to do uh, sort of in the closure uh, web stack is available to you. Go ahead. Does that wrap in the ring async uh, libraries? It does not wrap any of the ring async libraries. I wish it did. Um, David was just telling me that he's working on some ring async stuff. But that's one of the actual, I've got a, in my speaker notes here, um, is that the, that essentially from the point at which you wrap um, things in this, in this ring vertex adapter, um, you're now you're now synchronous. Um, so and that's so ring is looking at responses coming back, and as soon as you try to pass um, a channel or, or something like that, it 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 blows up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the state of that. Um, something else that was it was a question mark um, a question mark in uh, what September November at Toby's talk. It's still a question mark. Um, we have this really great um, sort of asynchronous uh, application platform, and we've all heard of this little library called Core Async, so wouldn't it be great if the two could meet? And the answer is, eh, they, they, it's still not quite there. Um, what would be really nice, and, and, and the pseudocode that, that Toby showed in his talk was, uh, you call an event bus messaging function and you get back a channel. That would be fantastic. Um, I've, that, that doesn't exist yet. Um, I, that work hasn't been done or it's not, it's not on GitHub for sure. Um, I've played around a little bit with core async, uh, both in the stuff that we've done at Intent. And as long as you have one instance of your vertical um, and depending on where you've put your, your Go block, um, things Things mostly work. Um, it's easy, it's very very easy to lose uh, lose the event bus message context. So that becomes another thing that you have to pass around um, where you didn't before. So I'm not sure yet that I've come across a use case where core async made things much more readable or simpler to reason about. Um, so in the end, um, and and for this demo, I've sort of I've just sucked it up and we have callbacks. So. And I'm, I'm more than happy to show anybody some of those, uh, those uh, core async attempts uh, later. <laughs> All, right. All right, so this is actually, um, this is kind of an overview of the demo. Um, I, I don't know if anybody here has ever used any kind of chat application. I figured this was sort of greenfield uh, you know, development. Um, anyway, it's, it, uh, it's going to demonstrate several of the features that I've talked about at Vertex, and it uh, sort of comes with four main components, and I have source code for each of these in the slides, and then I'll actually demo the live app. Um, so the core component is just, the, is just um, launching verticals. It's, it's the initialization that's, that happens uh, when the module starts up. It uh, goes out and launches the logger, the timestamper, and the web vertical. Um, the logger vertical is just listening for all the messages and storing them. Uh, the timestamper is periodically emitting a timestamp. So you, I guess you see some chat programs where every you know, 15 minutes or every hour you get a timestamp in your, in your chat log. Um, so that's what's happening there. The web 
uh, vertical is serving an HTML and some CSS and JavaScript, and it's also, and the interesting part is it's actually bridging the event bus through SockJS to a closure script client side app. So we're gonna see that um, in the web browser, I can actually use the event bus just like I can um, on, the, in, in, on the closure side. Um, so anyway, yeah, without further ado, All right, so this is, very simply, this is the, the core, so you can see, yeah, there's not much to it. I'm deploying verticals, uh, what do you do? <laughs> um, you do notice that uh, when you're deploying a vertical, you're not deploying a namespace or a class name or anything like that. You're actually uh, telling it where to find the file, and it is, so Vertex is looking at that, saying that's a CLJ file. I know that I can run CLJ files using the closure language module. Um, and so that's, that's what's sort of happening um, in this deployment. In this case, um, in this case, I've told line vertex that in it is the function. And then when it builds the module, it puts a little um, a vertical in there that basically it's uh, it's called out as the as the initial vertical, and then it calls the init method in the namespace that I've told line vertex about. So, um, so here's the logger, and so what what this is doing, and I, I'll tell you later um, why I split this into two parts. Um, so the, the the top is is the sort of main uh, logger namespace, and the bottom is the the implementation. Um, and so at the top, we can see here that. I'm just registering uh, message handlers on each of these event bus addresses. Um, so we have the chat address and the history address. Um, and then skipping down here, um, so the log handler is registered on the chat um, address. So when it receives a message, it's just going to uh, add that to an atom. So it's maintaining a list of messages um, in the application. And I'm not too worried about exceeding the, the memory limits of the machine during this demo, but of course you might want to try something different when you push this to production. Um, and then the history handler is actually, so it's registered on the history endpoint, and what that's doing is when a request comes in on that, um, on that address, it's grabbing the last in items from the, that history atom. And so we'll see how that's used in the client-side application in a minute. Um, there's the time stamper. So this is simply um, once a minute is just publishing on the chat channel. So this is that pub sub that we talked about, um, a message from user timestamp with the current date. So. And then last but not least, this is the, the web vertical. Um, so we're doing, we're serving files, you know, starting a web server, and then the sort of more interesting part is here. Actually, before I get to that, I will say, that, so Vertex has a pretty full-featured HTTP um, application API available to you, so it can do, um, in addition to just serving HTTP, it can do routing. It has some facilities in here, so you can see I've just said send file, and I'll, you know, you, use a, a string as a file name. Um, so it's, there, there is a lot there. You don't necessarily have to um, avoid it for this kind of application. If you, you know, if you can't use ring, you can still use this and it's not too bad. Um, but so like I said, the more interesting part is down here. This is actually where we're, we're bridging the event bus uh, through SockJS to the browser. And so this is just setting up that bridge and then, um, so this prefix is telling it, this is the path on which we're, we're, we're bridging the event bus on our HTTP server. And then these two uh, sets of, these two collections of maps right here, this is um, how you secure the event bus from your client. So here you can specify communications from the client through to the event bus um, are only allowed on these two channels. And then here, you can specify that outgoing, so from the event bus back to the client, can only come 
on those two. I said channels. I meant uh, I meant uh, addresses. Um, only on those two addresses. And there's some further capability there, um, which I don't have here. The app is really isn't uh, complex enough to need it. But you can specify uh, address uh, regular <laughs> expressions that have to match. And you can also, um, although it's a little basic at this point, you can specify the um, exact format of the messages that are allowed to pass as well. So for instance, maybe you have um, something that uh, it, it can execute some predefined queries on an endpoint. So you can specify each of those messages. Um, and if that message doesn't match exactly, it won't get passed through uh, from the client uh, back to the event bus. Um, so yeah, uh, any questions? before I launch into the demo? No? All right. All right, so. Actually, I have a question. Yeah, please. So, um, so when you have the, 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 the like, restrictions for which addresses there, mm -hmm. is there also a way to like, at runtime say, also now you can do this, or, or no, you can no longer do this pattern? Or is um, that like only when you create the bridge? I'm not sure, actually. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Other questions? No? All right. Let's see. Oh, that's incredibly tiny. All right, can everybody see this? Yeah? OK. All right, so I've got two modules, actually. So this application, what I just showed you, the code that you saw um, was one module. Uh, more or less, and then I've actually got a second module to demonstrate some failover. The actual code behind that isn't quite as interesting. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch. So I'm saying vertex run mod. I've given it, uh, these are the vertex coordinates, so it's essentially group ID, uh, application ID version separated by tildes. Um, and then this flag on the end, this dash HA, um, stands for high availability, and that also implies the cluster flag. So I'm going to launch this, and hopefully it will work. All right, so I have now that vertical, or sorry, that module is running. So I'm going to go, I'm going to fumble around here for a second. OK. so. All right, can everybody basically see this? So, sorry, let me just, is that better or worse? No? All right, so I have a box down here. I can just type in my handle, and I can put messages out on the event bus. They show up here. Um, that's not that interesting, because I could be faking it. So let's pull up another web browser. And all right, so there's I'm attached to the event bus. I've got the timestamps coming in. Um, you'll notice when I loaded the second web browser that it actually populated some history. That's that history command. So um, the client actually uh, sent a message to the history endpoint in, in and said, "Give me." It asked for five elements. It only had one available. Um, and so that's, this is a very simple um, just demonstration of bridging that event bus to the client. So let's start another vertical, or another module level. So this is, um, this is another module. And all of, the, all of this code and everything is available. And the script for doing all of this is available um, in GitHub right now. So you guys can check it out after the after we're done. Um, so this is the Vertex Chat Robot. So I'm launching, I'm launching that with the same module specifier, but our Vertex Chat Robot. Notice I've also specified three instances. Um, and I also have specified high availability. So let's launch this. And for some reason, that occasionally happens. <laughs> and it didn't happen at that time. I, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
so anyway, you can see here I've got actually some initialization messages, um, Robo 1, 2, and 3. And I, that code is actually using some, um, using a, a capability that we have in, that we love in Clojure, right, is the ability to, to, to do concurrent access to, um, you know, things like atoms. So it's actually using an atom because those three instances of the vertical were launched in the same vertex instance, uh, they're actually using the same closure runtime, which is really nice. And so we can use an atom just in the way that we, we would expect to and um, increment it and use that to name our, our robots. So um, let's double check that. There are some robots that have joined. Yeah. And those are my lame attempts at, at making random emoticons. <laughs> so that's, uh, oh, that's not work. There we go. Okay, so this is, this is pretty cheesy. <laughs> um, let's do something a little more interesting. Let's kill that, uh, let, I'm gonna kill the robot module. From orbit, it's the only way to be sure. All right, so that one's dead. I've killed that, that vertex instance. And I can see over here that that completely blew up. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, Okay, uh, end of demo. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. I, I apologize that that didn't work. That worked great uh, when I went through all this beforehand. So what we would have seen is that uh, after killing that uh, robot uh, vertex instance, those three robots would have started up on the first uh, vertex instance and we would have still been able to interact with them in the chat room. Um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste everybody's time debugging uh, what might have changed at the last second. No, so, what's that? That's probably something to do with not having internet connection. I actually tested it without a Wi-Fi connection, um, thinking that that would that would be the case. But anyway, um, that's what would have happened, and I encourage you all to play with it and send in your PRs to fix whatever whatever <laughs> I broke. It looks like a race. It says there's such bar, so either they're not sharing the closure runtime or they're not being initialized in the right order. Um, yeah, it should be. Tell you what, let's um, let's let let's play that game real quick and see, and just bring up one instance. Because I would like to demonstrate failover. All right, we've got those. Let's double check that we can All right, that's working. Let's uh, let's see. Do we have we've got a, we've got one robot. Yep. Well, that's a scowl. All right. And let's try to kill this guy. Killed him. Hey, there we go. Yep. Got, uh, so we saw that node, that node failed. Um, and we can see that this vertex instance brought up that, uh, that module. So high availability demo. Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah. Just run out of loop. Yeah. Um, all right. So, and uh, yeah, let's send another message to the the robot. Um, yeah. And Robo One is back in business. So, all right. Um, so that's that's the extent of, of the demo. I'm going to move on to talk about testing. Unless anybody has any other questions about this, or um, I, I don't. Uh, I I didn't actually put up a slide of my awful awful closure script. 
Um, the only the only vertex related things it's doing is is publishing on the event bus and receiving messages from the event bus, and it looks exactly the same as the closure um, verticals that we've already seen. And the rest of it is me trying to use uh, reagent and and kind of stumbling around badly. So you guys can check that out in the GitHub repo. All right, let's go back to this. All right, testing. Um, this is this was a notable omission from the closure conscious presentation, um, but there is some some reasonable support for doing uh, doing testing in sort of a vertex um, style. So they um, vertex test tools namespace provides this as embedded um, function, I believe, and what that's essentially doing is um, wrapping wrapping your test, in this case, because I'm, I'm using it as a fixture using a, a closure test, it's wrapping this in an embedded vertex instance and allowing you to do sort of the, the things you expect to be able to do, like uh, register handlers, send messages. Um, and then you can also, um, when you call this vertex test tools test complete, um, that's essentially telling that embedded vertex instance that I'm done. Um, here are some, some things that I'm going to assert about the test. Uh, they're just uh, normal, normal closure test uh, is there. Uh, shut the embedded vertex down. Um, so this actually, this works pretty well. I can run it from line test. Um, now part of the reason that I, you noticed before I split up the logger into kind of the, the namespace that was registering event handler or event bus handlers and, um, and then there was the implementation namespace. Um, you get into the situation where when you require a, um, a, a file that, or a, a namespace that's, that's uh, in it, at its root level, it's uh, trying to register message handlers or something like that, and it doesn't have a vertex instance already available to it, um, that blows up completely. Um, so it just becomes convenient to, to split things up like this. Um, when you're launching things through a vertex instance and it's starting the vertical, then it's already created um, sort of all the necessary infrastructure for that to come up without without blowing up completely. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's testing. And um, let's see, uh, the other thing I was just going to mention, I, something I discovered in, in trying to put together some of these tests is that there's actually a bug in the current version of the modeling closure that doesn't allow you to run more than one test using the test tools as embedded. It doesn't reset its state um, in the way that it needs to. Um, but a fix for that is also uh, coming in the next release. So. All right, and that's actually, that's about it. Um, here are all the, the resources that I've mentioned. So there's the Vertex homepage. Um, they have tons of documentation. It's actually really well put together. Um, there's both a sort of getting started manual, there's a, a what is a module and, and how, to, um, how to run Vertex and, and all the various sort of things you can do. And then there's actually a language specific, uh, very, very thorough manual for each of the officially supported languages. Um, so it's actually, it's really good. Um, especially for a framework that's as young as it is, it's clear that they put an emphasis on documentation, which is really refreshing. Um, and then there's a link also to uh, Toby Crawley's talk from the Conj. I highly recommend uh, watching that. Uh, we cover a lot of the same things, but he says it all with a really lovely, like, North Carolina accent. Um, and so then there's uh, the line vertex and ring vertex adapter links um, to GitHub. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody is currently maintaining line vertex. Um, I know Toby has made a few commits, and I actually, everything, <coughs> that I've put together today was done on a version that I had to modify to actually support the latest uh, version of Vertex so that I didn't have to uh, manually pull in a closure lane module, um, things like that. Uh, and then there's a link to, to these slides and all of the, the demo code is out there on GitHub. So any, any questions or comments? Yeah. So <clears throat> one question I have about Vertex around mm -hmm. and in the past, I'd love you to, to speak about it a little bit more. I know you touched on it a bit earlier, is, is you know, how, do you, how does one define a vertical and use a vertical? Mm -hmm. what, what are the delineation points for it? What benefits do you get out of splitting your app this way? Um, so 
you think about a vertical as sort of the, the, the core um, the core unit of vertex, right? And so one of the first things uh, you you can um, specify how many instances of that you run. So if you have some piece of functionality or some um, you know some sort of logical breakdown of your code, and you want to be able to scale that horizontally, um, that sounds like a vertical, right? Um, it's other than that, I think this, the sky is pretty much um, the limit. I mean, uh, we're, we're running. Uh, Verticals in another project that are registered on multiple uh, handlers, not just not just a few. Um, anything that you want to be able to um, start up and shut down independently. Um, so if you have, um, if you want to be able to reinitialize um, a vertical, that reinitialize some some piece of, of your of your application, um, that's a good candidate for a vertical as well. So go ahead. Do they have mechanisms for splitting an address space? Sharding sort of things. So if you want to start up some n number of instances mm -hmm. that support a portion of your user base, mm -hmm. so you can uh, do load balancing and intelligent ways. Um, they don't at the moment. That's something that you have to either write into your app, or there's actually a project out there called Vertigo, um, which I, I I will modify this and put a link to that on um, in the in the presentation. Um, they purport to do some of those things. I'm not sure if, if address space sharding is necessarily one of them, but they do a lot of the kind of uh, the grunt work of managing a distributed application in a sensible way on top of Vertex. Um, so you can still you know, do things like use the event bus at, at that fundamental level, but as far as saying, oh, I want 10 verticals, 10 of these verticals running this instance and 11 of these other verticals running over here, and some of them are high availability and some of them are not. And um, I, I think it's trying to handle a lot of that for you, just let you sort of specify the behavior of the cluster you want. Um, unfortunately, I haven't played with it at all, but it, it's, okay, uh, it's there. there some place to look. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, how reliable is messaging? Like, you mentioned things turned in, like, it, uh, does, there, does it kind of set receipts of if you put a high set of messages? Um, you, so there actually, there's a capability that I didn't um, demonstrate, but when you are doing the point-to-point -point messaging, you can specify reply handlers and timeouts and error handlers. Uh, so uh, in that case, you actually will get an indication if your message was not delivered, um, you know, if, if you were sending to an address where nobody's listening, um, if you were expecting a reply and none came within the timeout period, um, you'll get a notification of that. Um, the pub sub, I actually don't believe you'll get any. Uh, I think you can you can publish messages to whatever um, addresses you want, and if nobody's listening, you'll never know. Um, so, yeah. Question, David, or question? Yeah, yeah please. Um. Um, can you talk a little bit about how errors are handled? That you, you described it as kind of an actor model. Does that carry forward as well into the error handling? You know. Are, like, are there verticals that supervise other verticals and hierarchy and that kind of stuff, like, like an Erlang type of thing? Or if, if you would like to have verticals that supervise other verticals, you, you can definitely write it that way. Um, and something, so uh, one of the patterns I've used is in, the, in a, actually in a um, semi-related way is to have verticals watching a shared data structure for errors and shutting down, you know, other verticals, um, but you you have to design it that way. Um, okay, that, so there's nothing built in. There's nothing built in like that. No, no. It's um, the the interface you have to things like um, like event bus errors are error handlers on event bus functions that you're calling. So does that sort of answer your question? Or I think so. yeah. Uh, is it possible for external clients to connect to receive messages on the event bus in a standard way? Um, in a standard way, I'm not. Like, is there a port number and a host that you can just connect to as an external, like another application, and just receive, I don't know, AMPQ messages or whatever it is? Right, so there's nothing built in. Um, I know that Toby and the Immutant group have done some work um, doing a JMS to event, bu uh, event bus bridge. Um, I haven't explored that at all, but I know it's out there. Um, and then aside from that, um, I think that's that's a case of roll your own. It is, it, it is just JSON. Um, so 
you know you could easily just expose an endpoint to to take JSON and, and chuck it on the event bus. Yeah. Um, so obviously, architecturally, the other way of developing asynchronous polyglot applications is just to run multiple processes. Mm -hmm. um, in your decades of experience using Vertex, uh, when when would you use Vertex, and when would you just use multiple processes? Whether they be multiple instances of the same one, or you know, just writing different things with different processes. Um. So something. There are some things that, that I, I haven't necessarily enjoyed about, um, about Vertex, but I will say that the, the simplicity of, of messaging is, I, I, was, I was surprised and, re, and, and really refreshed that it's, that, it, it's so easy to, to set up um, communication between pieces of your code and the sort of multicast discovery of, of and, and setting up of a cluster across a network, um, it, it just works. So um, my argument is that, uh, my argument for, for choosing Vertex is probably that if you want something that you can spin up very quickly, um, then that's, it's, a, it's a fantastic choice. If you're looking for something that's, um, and you're very, very concerned about performance or something like that, you might have to explore what Vertex offers in those uh, in those areas, and and then decide. Um, I know that um, oh, what's this? Uh, the, the fellow who does the call me maybe. Um, Alex Yes. Just had this conversation. Okay. <laughs> All I can think of is animated Barbie dolls. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, so I know I know that somebody's done a Jepson test of Hazelcast, which which underlies a lot of Vertex. Um, I only know that because I saw the placeholder for the results. I didn't actually see the results. Um, so that's, that forms another question I'd like that might inform decisions about uh, when to use Vertex and when not. So, go ahead. I'm sorry, can you speak I don't know. I was trying to find out with the question I asked uh, first here. We're, uh, I know at Intent we're using it, but uh, not. it's not client-facing. It's for some internal tools, and it's very, uh, I'd call it very raw right now. Do you think it's ready for production? I, that's probably the answer that, you know, you see, you see me waffling a little bit. Um, I think the, at least my experience with the closure language module is that it's, it, it feels like maybe 98% there. Um, so I, I think, I mean, Toby and those guys have done a great job getting it to the, to the point it's at, and um, it's the, the API that they're, they're wrapping um, is full featured with respect to the rest of, of the sort of Vertex ecosystem. Um, but I, I haven't gotten the impression that there's a lot of people doing especially not doing uh, closure on Vertex in production just based on the experiences that I've had. Vertex in general? Um, I don't know, actually. Yeah, I, I would love to know. And I, I don't know if uh, Toby asked that question at the Conj and, and got a similar, like, everybody's hands behind their back. But uh, nobody at the closure meetup in uh, New York is using it in production except for, except for us. Are there any monitoring tools or user interfaces for, for Vertex? Um, hmm, I don't believe there are. I think there's a Hazelcast um, monitoring, or at least a couple of Hazelcast monitoring tools that you might be able to to, uh, to hook in. Um, but yeah, I'm not aware of any. Although I would encourage, if you have questions about specific um, like functionality or capabilities, check out the uh, the module repository and just do a search because there's there might be something out there that I haven't tried to use yet, but it does exist, so. Any other questions? All right, well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening.